speaker tonight. Um, I'm not going to go through his resume and, and everything, but I just want to say myself, uh, the executive board, the board, um, we went through uh, a great uh, search for someone that we felt would be a, a great executive director and leader for the BRI for now and the future. So I just will keep it simple and like to say welcome, congratulations, and we look forward to having you for the next however many years at the BRI as our executive director and leader, Tim Foley. Thank you so much, Vinny, and uh, good evening, everybody. It is so wonderful to be here tonight. Um, and hopefully you feel the same way at the end of my little speech. So, first of all, I want to start off by saying how delighted I am to be here and honored and humbled to be part of an organization with as long and as storied a history as the BRI. It is an organization that has faithfully looked after its members' interests and served its members' needs in good times and in bad for over 70 years. It looked after the needs of our industries and our members during the post-war boom for both the economy and the population. It was there during the 50s and 60s, a time that created a thriving middle class that became the envy of the world. It was there throughout the stagflation of the 70s and the go-go 80s. It was there for the wave of businesses who decided that, you know what? Suburban office parks are the wave of the future. They'll attract young, productive workers. Of the and then it was also there when they decided maybe what we want to do is move back into the big vibrant cities. And it is here now when it's trying to find a happy middle where the workers can be in the city but can be on the Metro North lines here in Westchester County. And we'll be here for whatever the next trend is going to be. It's been here through the growth of Westchester cities, through their urban blight, through their urban renewal, and now through what they're calling the urban renaissance. Members in this room were here for the Great Recession. You were here for the recovery. You're now here for what is a long-lived, slow, but steady, and historic level upward trajectory for our economy, where growth is once again the watchword in Westchester County and in the Hudson Valley. And you and your businesses will be here for the next downturn, whenever it may come. And then you'll be here for the next boom after that, for there surely will be one. And your trade association, the BRI, will be with you every step of the way. On a personal note, I have to say it has been so remarkable during my 15 days on the job, but who's counting? to realize how deep the roots of this organization are for so many of our members. Some of you are here for the first time tonight, and we say welcome. Some of you have been here for maybe about a year, we say welcome as well. But some of you have been coming through your families, generations, for decade upon decade upon decade. Some of you are even the second or third generation in your business, in your membership, in the BRI. One person I met used to attend summer social events with the Builders Institute when he was a teenager. Others got involved as an apartment owner or a home builder 30 years ago, or as more as an investment, or perhaps a temporary career move, but then they never looked back. Some of you have held completely separate jobs, and still do, but you looked out for the interests of your home, your community, your building, and got involved through your co-op or your condo board entering a whole new world that you're somehow managing to be productive in in your spare time. Some of you have a st style that's cutting edge, and some of you are decidedly old school, and all of you have a home at the BRI, and it is a home that's built to last. This is an organization that wears its values on its sleeve, and whose basic principles have stayed the test of time through good times and bad. The BRI stands for inclusiveness, to represent and serve our members, representing all components of residential and commercial building, realty management, and related professional supplier and service-based industries. The BRI brings us together around legal and legislative advocacy to seek out opportunities to affirm principles of property rights, fair and due process, equal opportunity, sensible regulation affordable housing and legislative reform wherever possible, and all towards the free and fair pursuit of a better living and working environment with housing and economic opportunities for all. The BRI exists for enhancement, for education, 
for better planning, to help our members with knowledge and information vital to both personal and business growth, enrichment and productivity. But the knowledge doesn't just stay with us, we also use the Institute to use the resources to encourage best planning, zoning and management practices, raising the bar of excellence for environmentally sound, sensible and sustainable growth and development. And while all of that sounds very fancy, you should know I can't take credit for all of it. I didn't write those words. They were written in the founding documents of the Institute, and they're as relevant today as ever they were. But to me as a new guy, they boil down to a very simple principle. We exist to help you make your business even better and to stick with you against forces that will impinge upon. Towards that end, I want to spend some time talking about where we find ourselves this year, in 2020. There's no way around it. 2019 was an incredibly difficult year for many of you in this room, and for many more of you not in this room tonight. The headwinds coming out of Albany, particularly for apartment owners, but also for co-ops and builders, and downstream of that to the service providers who rely on them for business, were very difficult to weather. We will be struggling with the continued effects of these challenges in the year to come. But I think there are also opportunities that can be capitalized on as well. So let's start with the builder's side of the building and realty institute. Although there are many problems with how the construction and home building industry is regulated, some of them years and, in the case of the scaffold law, over a century in the making, the long-term trend has been on a positive swing for a while now. Across the country, in terms of the total value of both public and private sector construction spend spending, by 2015 and 2016, the industry had roughly matched the zenith of the years right before the Great Recession, which had been the previous high. And the good news is that this time, instead of a bubble bursting, the growth has kept right on going in the intervening years. And we've seen that and felt that here in Westchester, with lots of buzz around mixed-use construction transit-oriented developments, with the effective and strategic use of some of the IDAs in the area, with opportunities like the citywide rezoning in New Rochelle and the boom in residential res developments all along the Hudson River. But there were plenty of bumps in the road, and there are continued preventing us from fully capitalizing on the intense interest in, develop in development and revitalization. First and foremost is the industry-wide labor shortage. During the Great Recession, many skilled and unskilled laborers who had made their careers in the construction industry had to go elsewhere to feed their families when the work dried up, and many of them never returned. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, in April 2019, there were 434,000 vacant construction jobs nationwide. And on that same survey, 80% of construction firms said they were having a hard time filling hourly and craft positions. Assuming that the pace of growth in the construction industry continues close to its current pace, that void will grow to 747,000 more employees needed by 2026. The effects of a labor shortage are obvious. Jobs slow down while waiting for these positions to be filled. Contractors and subcontractors are in some cases paying higher wages to ensure that they have the people power necessary to take on the job. All of that comes with a cost. The Turner Building Cost Index, which measures costs in the non-residential building construction market, showed, and again this is nationwide, a growth of 5.86% in 2018 and another 5% growth in costs this year, with much of that connected to the labor shortage. Particularly to us here in Westchester County, again, continuing nationwide trend, there's a high amount of interest in things like sustainability and resiliency and clean energy and new constructions, particularly in high-end single-family homes, but also in multi-family development. Features that decrease energy consumption and with it emissions of greenhouse gases are a real selling point for many potential future customers. They save on energy costs over the life of the building. They insulate the owners from future energy price shocks, be it from the current or future natural gas moratoriums, the closing of Indian Point, or other potential disruptions and complications as New York State, and perhaps the federal government, move towards concrete goals and mandates towards carbon neutral goalposts. Solar panels, 
better insulation, ground source heat pumps and the like. These days, there's no other word for it. They're cool. People want them. Many of them come with tax incentive programs and subsidies from the state, from NYSERDA, from the federal government, from the utility companies themselves. But navigating these programs is an added layer of complexity. And with any added layer of complexity, that also brings with it cost. The housing market at most levels has gotten through the first year of the new federal cap on the state and local tax deductions without quite the extreme effects that some had been predicting, except of course at the high end of the market where the chilling effect has been far more noticeable. To sum up, in general, business is relatively good, but there are big problems, particularly related to costs and labor shortage in some areas where it's real and acute. It's important to underline the problems that we actually have, because one of the big things that made 2019 so challenging is instead of solving those problems, there was a lot of effort to solve problems that we didn't have. You'll see that also on the real estate side. Although there has been a major jump in multifamily and mixed-use developments, particularly around transit hubs, Westchester County, like all of the communities in the greater New York area, continues to struggle with the shortage of affordable housing. We all know it. The Hudson Valley is a very desirable place to live, work, and play, but it's a struggle for some to afford it. Westchester County Executive George Latimer, as you heard, commissioned and released a countywide housing needs assessment, which provides some real data to put these challenges into digestible terms. The report found that there were 345,885 housing units in the county today. <coughs> Problem number one, that's not enough. The report found a need for 82,451 additional uh, uh, affordable units in support of population, and that means we need an additional 12,000 affordable units. And that's even with the surges that we've seen in development. Some of this is modest growth of first-time home owners, those who are in the 30 to 44 range, and we're expecting that age cohort to continue. A Cornell University projection found the county's population of those people will grow by about 7.5% in the next five years. So we need somewhere to live. But the same study found explosive growth in one particular sector of Westchester County residents, seniors. In the past few years, the 65 to 74 population went up 26.7% in the county. The 75 and older cohort went up by 52.3%. And finally, those over 85 went up by 44%. Suffice to say, that's not people in those age ranges migrating here. The taxes and the weather seem to that. It's people who are aging in place. That's a very different side of the affordable housing question. Seniors living on fixed income than you often hear about when this issue is talked about among policymakers. But it gets to problem number two, the condition of the housing. That means that the housing that we have needs a lot of work. The county exec report found that 81% of our housing stock was built before 1979, and 30% of it was built before 1940. That's a huge challenge in the features, again, think about where the population growth is, for accessibility, for making homes and apartment buildings that are accessible to those and comfortable for those who are facing disabilities and other health challenges. Especially the over 80, which are sometimes nicknamed the quote-unquote frail elderly. They have specific needs that those homes aren't designed around. Problem three, we need a lot of work in, the, in another area. We need to improve to adapt to the aforementioned green policies and clean energy efficiencies, and that means major repairs and often system replacements. That's necessary, and within a few years, may well be in reaction to government mandates and sticks rather than what we have now, which is a, albeit confusing, at least positive network of incentives and carrots but it will be a further challenge to the ultimate question of affordability, because simply put, someone will need to pay for those improvements. There are many aspects to the affordability question. There are wages for 
of those who are renting, which were effectively flat for decades, though in recent years there's been a slow, noticeable increase. There are external drains on family budgets, reflecting changes to the tax code, increases in health care costs, dramatic increases in education, particularly higher education, and the effect that all of these have on Westchester's highest in the nation property taxes. Those are all questions of affordability. There is a supply of housing itself, basic economics, supply and demand, and as you've heard, it is too low. You add all that together, and you get the worst side of the affordability housing crisis. How many families fall into a more severe crisis of homelessness? Between 2011 and 2015, the total homeless shelter population in New York State outside of New York City went from 59,788 people to 84,222 people. Four years, a 41% increase. Here in Westchester, our homeless population has increased by 31% since 2010. And today, statewide, over 250,000 New Yorkers are expected to be homeless at some point in this year. If all of them lived in a single place, that would be the third largest city in our state. No one should be comfortable with that reality, and especially no one should be comfortable over the fact that three out of five of them are school-aged children. These are complex issues, to be sure. Many of them are questions of economics of supply and demand, of efficiency. Some of them reflect new challenges, but some of them, to be honest, have been with us for a very long time. As JFK once said, our problems are man-made. Therefore, they may be solved by man. Call me an optimist, but I think that's right. There's no good reason why progress can't be made on them. But progress will not be made on them if in the course of trying to solve these larger problems, we also undermine property rights, we undermine due process, we got economic opportunity. Indeed, some of our problems that dedicated professionals and business owners, including many people in this room, have the intelligence, the expertise, and the passion for their neighborhoods and their communities to be part of the solution. And some would even be good business to solve. There are many hardworking elected officials who recognize these realities and how complex they are to address. They understand that our builders, the real estate industry, and the business community can be and should be resources and partners in solutions. But in 2019, something went astray. Too many politicians and normally sober-minded policy professionals did not wrap their arms around these complexities. Instead, in the face of challenges, but also opportunities, they chose to simplify everything. They channeled their inner Jimmy McMillan, and they declared that the problem was simply that the rent is too damn high and the wages are too damn low. In doing so, what they proposed as solutions poured gasoline on many of these problems. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the full gamut, but I'm going to focus on two examples that threaten to upend our industry, industries, and that we will continue to struggle this year. The first is prevailing wage. The governor proposed and the Senate strongly champion, championed a prevailing wage mandate for construction where the project had any public dollars at play. This is based on what is a long-standing practice of setting a prevailing wage rate for public works projects which the New York State Constitution defines as projects that are state financed. In recognition of New York's long commitment to being a union-friendly state, the broader principle is that the public dollar shouldn't be used to undermine unions or the collective bargaining process or to set up a race to the bottom in terms of wages, health benefits, safety, other factors. And as far as that goes, fair enough. But these new proposals, aren't on what we would normally consider to be a public work. The definition in the bill that was introduced in the Senate, and is still active to this day, includes private projects that receive tax breaks, public subsidies, and other sources of funding, including from industrial development agencies, IDAs, or local economic development corporations. All right, but let's take a step back to remember what those credits are actually for. Therefore, building affordable housing, 
including affordable workforce housing that many laborers might benefit from in their communities. There are brownfield cleanup tax credits and other incentives without which no development would take place on certain sites. There are tax credits for, you've heard this already, energy efficiency or clean energy improvements. There are subsidies and financing dedicated to revitalizing Westchester's urban centers for the economic growth and the benefit of the whole community. In short, most of them are not perks. They're incentives to do the type of projects that state and local leaders have already said that they want, but which would not move forward if they're not economically viable. That's what they're for. The proposal last year would have, would have said, if you accept any of these, you must pay a prevailing wage. And that's designed to shrink the distance between the rates paid by subcontractors to union workers and non-union workers. That gap varies a lot. By averages, maybe 10 to 15 percent nationwide. But it varies a lot by industry and the type of worker. Here in Westchester, it's not uncommon in some industries and for some types of workers for that gap to be 30 percent or more. How does it make sense economically to accept an incentive to do these valuable projects from a, that are needed from the public's perspective, but then to jack up the costs for a value even above what you've incentivized for? It doesn't. What problem are we solving? There's plenty of work for union laborers in Westchester County and in New York State in general. According to the building trades themselves, just looking at New York City, even open shop projects are more than 50% union on average, and of the 10 largest projects under construction in the five boroughs today, six are union, and only four are open shop. We have a similar mix in the Hudson Valley. And keep in mind what we just said a few minutes ago, the problems we're experiencing in construction are a labor shortage and high demand for projects that are more costly but are more in demand or serve a public purpose. No one is saying that the problem with construction is we're not spending more to achieve the same result. And although more needs to be done as a society to raise wages more broadly, it's part of the affordable housing question, in every industry, we're not talking about someone who used to get paid seven bucks an hour, now getting 15. We're talking about someone getting paid $65 an hour in a good, reliable job, now being required to be paid $85. And if the project can't go forward because it doesn't make sense economically anymore, at that point, they're down to zero. The governor, just this week, a couple of days ago, came out with his newest version of the plan in his budget. It was released Tuesday night. It does make a number of concessions, does have a number of carve-outs, and we need to carefully review it, and more importantly, pass that information on to you so you know what's coming. We need to pay attention to its intended and unintended consequences. We need to talk to you about what the real effects are, and then we need to spell those out for decision makers. On the realty side, it's a similar story. I don't need to tell you that the effects of last year's once-in-a-generation level of change to the rent laws have affected the industry deeply and how much it will serve as a drag on the approximately 25,000 rental apartments in Westchester County that are covered, and the 500,000 other apartment dwellings, co-op apartments, single-family condominium units, and single-family dwellings that are also implicated by parts of this law, as well as how it will downstream have an effect on builders working on new housing and service providers supporting these homes. The BRI, the AOAC and the CCAC warned decision makers that if the rent reforms passed, it would dramatically impact housing and values for multifamily homes. And sure enough, some of this has started to happen. Just yesterday, Signature Bank announced that they have begun to cut back on their loans to owners of rent regulated buildings and plan to further rein in that line of business. Initial data from New York City has found that multifamily home sales are down and they're down by double digits compared to the equivalent time frames in the previous years. And we would, shouldn't be surprised if we hear more bad news, or at least more notes of worry on the financial side. But given what we just said about the specific problems of Westchester, older housing stocks, 
major improvements needed, a push for more housing that is accessible to seniors, the elderly, and the disabled, a drive to be more energy efficient, clean, and resilient. How on earth are we going to pay for any of the improvements that we need to do, given what this law did to the major capital improvements and the individual apartment improvements? Increases in rent to pay for building-wide improvements such as the replacement of boilers, roofs, and windows, to make hallways and common areas more accessible, the building, the building more efficient, energy efficient, to put solar panels on the roof. Those used to have a 15% cap when they were being factored into the rent. Spread out over the whole building, over a number of years, you can make that manageable. That's not limited to 2%. And the monthly costs will be even lower because they changed the formula in the amortization. How will those improvements, which remember, we have said as a society, are a public good, they are things that our states and local leaders agree should be done. How will those improvements be made if no one wants to pay for them? And there's no likelihood for apartment building owners to recoup their investment. Same thing for IAS. With the increased rent for a refurbished unit limited to $15,000 improvements over a 15-year period, how long before those units are simply too expensive to be renovated? And then how long will they stay off the market? And how on earth does that help our issues with affordability or sustainability? It doesn't. These provisions were pushed because of claims of widespread fraud. Well, this is a real world. The folks in this room know that there are some bad actors out there. There's fraud. It's a whole industry of black eye. Nobody likes it. If someone's exploiting a loophole, let's close it. It's not fair. If someone's doing the wrong thing, let's investigate it. Let's stop it. But why on earth would you sweep up the good actors, the responsible landlords, and the well-governed co-ops from doing what you already agree they need to do to improve our housing issues? Well, it's 2020, I regret to inform you that the same short-sighted solutions are still being pushed today. And I mean today, while I was fine-tuning these remarks, I had on in the background the Senate Committee on, on Housing and on Investigations and Government Operations joint hearing on proposed legislation regarding enforcement of housing and building codes. To be fair, it was a very interesting discussion, a lot because I'm a nerd. A lot of it focused on unequal enforcement, DOB training, insufficient funding for municipalities, wide variations in resources and standards. The AG talked about enforcement. There's honestly quite a lot that we could possibly work on together. Some issues that are issues for our members that they clearly missed. But the tenant groups who testified largely did not engage on those individual bills even though they were subject the subject of the hearing. Instead, speaker after speaker wanted to talk about only one bill, and that bill wasn't on the agenda. It is the so-called good cause eviction bill, which in their own terms, using their own terminology, creates universal rent control, adds new layers and delays onto the eviction process, before I might add, before we've even seen how the effects of H. TSBA's eviction provisions are working out, and is written so broadly that it affects contracts within co-ops, affects sublets, it affects single-family homes in some cases. That is not going to solve the econ economics of supply and demand or the long history of flatline wages that got us to this affordability crisis. You already know what BRI is doing about this, and will continue to do about it. Step one is our lawsuit, challenging what was passed last law on constitutional grounds, making the case that it was arbitrary, that it was capricious, that it ought not to stand. You know that we have been involved in coalition efforts. Arguably last year, not enough. This year we have to do much more, and we're already in conversations with similar organizations representing landlords north of here, the capital region. Syracuse and Rochester and the North Country to try and beat back this good cause eviction law from doing even further damage. 
you know that we're in a coalition effort because it was mentioned at some points last year against prevailing wage. Many of the groups that are leading the charge on that are based here in Westchester County. And we will continue in those efforts and continue to keep you apprised of that. And we will be focused more than ever on having conversations with decision leaders at all levels, all year long, not just when we get to the crisis. There's no way you could look at the problems that are affecting all of our industries and say that they're focused on the right things. So let's refocus them on the right things. And throughout all of this, our members need education on these issues, not just on the legislative side. If we're really going to tackle some of these problems with affordable housing, with the demand for sustainability, we need speakers to come and tell us what we should be focused on, how we can use it, how we can make our businesses better as a direct result. How do we navigate the web of tax credits? How do we navigate the different programs that are out there, both for new developments and for existing apartment buildings? How do we get to do things better? That's a lot of what we're focused on last year. This is not going to work unless we change the conversation with our decision makers. Right now, there's a popular impression that they can do really whatever they want. Because, of course, there's a sect of, quote-unquote, greedy landlords who are hiding all of their money in a vault like Scrooge McDuck, and if they just squeeze that sponge, the water will automatically replenish itself. That's not the case. Make no mistake, there are certainly some unscrupulous players in this marketplace, and in every marketplace. There are bad developers. There are bad landlords. But there are also bad tenants. There are also good landlords. There are also good developers. There are also good tenants. One of the more interesting things to me last year, when rent reform was being passed, was I spent a lot of time on Twitter. I don't recommend the experience, to be honest. You're just going to get mad. But sometimes um, you'll find something that's very positive. Most of the time it's a dog or a cat video, but sometimes it's something that speaks to where you actually are. And as the rent reform laws were being passed, I came upon this tweet. I complain about my overpriced apartment a lot, but tonight my landlord got out of his bed to let me into my apartment because I locked myself out for a second time. My building is owned by a family that treats me as their own. This is what I love about New York. That was a tweet from the political director of the union, 1199 SEIU, which although they were not leading the charge, certainly played a supportive role in getting rent reform passed in the first place. And it just goes to show you that there's a different conversation to be had out there other than there are greedy developers, greedy landlords, and they're hiding their money like Scrooge McDuck. McDuck. One of my favorite TV shows of the last few years was Mad Men. And there's a famous quote from it from Don Draper. If you don't like what's being said, change the conversation. That's our goal for this year, to change that conversation. And it starts with restating our values, because at the end of the day, I think our values are pretty clear. They've been expressly articulated in this organization for over seven decades now. And they're things that, to be honest, I think most people, even if they're not in this industry, agree with. We believe in affordable, safe housing for Westchester County residents. We believe that other than the health of your family members, your home is the bedrock of your life. They're the center of your family. They're the stable bedrock of your community. Property values and the investments that owners place into their own homes is very important. It's a key investment for most families, but it even transcends that. Whether you rent or whether you own, there is something truly sacred about the place that you call home. We also believe in good jobs, reasonable wages, and responsible development, which can be the economic engine for all of our communities. And we believe that we're seeing that unleashed in another urban renaissance. We believe that the home building, repairing, and remodeling jobs we need to achieve this can and should be win-win for the people that the industry employs. And we have a lot of ideas about that. We have ways of encouraging training. We have ways that we can lower the rate of injuries and lower liability as a direct result. We can ensure that minority and female workers receive prevailing wages. 
which in this prevailing wage law, many analysts say, will do the exact opposite. And we encourage the participation of a future labor force in apprenticeship programs to join the construction industry, because we're going to need them. We believe that sustainability and clean energy can be both good business and good ethics, and is being driven as much by customer demand as, as public policy, and that is a good thing. And our mission, message to decision makers, nonprofits, building trades, advocates, members, and non-members alike is this. If you share these values, and you want to make real progress on these goals and these problems, if you want to build the Westchester County of tomorrow, the expertise, the passion, and the know-how you need are right here in the men and the women in this room today. And for over 70 years, their home has been the Builders Institute and the beyond. So what are we going to work for to address our challenges? First, we're going to focus, as always, on mutual defense. In the face of new challenges, new legislation, new regulations that unreasonably restrict or harms our allies in the building and real estate industry. Yes, this is a once in a generation level of impact on the rent side. It's not over. The only way we solve any of the problems that we face are together, because we are stronger together. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to be working to change that conversation. There are a lot of folks who think that they already know the answers. They already know what we're going to say. Be it in a lobby visit, be it reading through the newspaper, be it non-members who think that they know what the BRI is all about, be it members of the BRI who used to come, but I kind of know what it's all about. I'll check in when I have to. Our goal this year is to make all of those people take a second look and raise our profile and make it impossible to ignore what we have to say. Because what we have to say is going to make the decisions better. And it's going to make our industries better. It's going to make the Hudson Valley better. The goal should be safe, affordable, and sustainable homes for all. We can be part of the solution for that. We are part of the solution for that. We need to be at the table in Albany, in the county, and in our local districts. Because as they say, you're either on the table, you're either at the table or you're on the menu. In order to do that, we are going to ask more of you our members. You are the driving force of this organization. You are our best resource. You actually know stuff about what's going on in the industry. And we need to make sure that what you know is shared. We're going to ask you to engage in different types of advocacy, not just an occasional lobby day, not just signing on to a letter. The folks who are getting stuff done in Albany right now are using all the tools of the trade. They're using email, they're using text, they're on Twitter. They're recording videos and sending it to their legislators. They're inviting the legislators in, not just when their issue is on the agenda, but well before it actually gets to that point. That means we're going to send out more emails. We're going to ask you to do more. We know you're very busy. We wouldn't ask if it wasn't important. And we won't ask if it's not important. Conversation is a two-way street. We need, as an organization, to make sure we're delivering something that's valuable to you. And that includes finding the right mix of education, advocacy, and networking. I talked a lot about advocacy tonight. We won't always be talking about that. We'll also be talking about the practical information and the know-how where you can learn from each other and from industry experts on how to do your business better. We will also have events where you don't need to talk about anything. You can just network, make your connections, grow your business get to learn about people, get to know about what's going on. As I said from the get-go, you boil down our 70-year values and mission statement, and we exist for one reason. This is about how you make your business better and how to protect you from the things that's going to make your business work. So bear with us while we spend this year experimenting. But if you like what you hear, tell people about us. Bring them along. If you see stuff on social media, and you will start to see stuff from social media on I know it hasn't happened in the past, but, you know, I'm a 21st century guy. You're going to see it now. Tell people about it. Share it. Get other people involved. We have a fabulous radio program. You can't really share it right now. You're going to in about a month. Listen to it. Recommend it to people. 
because that is how other people are going to get educated about the experience that you see on the ground, and that's going to make this all together. These are all different ways that we can fulfill our basic mission, standing up for one another. The challenges that we face absolutely demand it. The opportunities that we face are vast. We can learn from each other, we can work together, and we can build a county and a Hudson Valley region that all of us on our future generations live in. True story, this morning I have a nine-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. And my daughter was very disappointed that I was not going to be home tonight before she went to bed. She said, what are you doing? Why do you always have meetings? And I said, do you know who I'm meeting with tonight? I'm meeting with the builders and I'm meeting with folks in real estate. And she said, that's fine, you can go to that. <laughs> because she knows the value of building. They're right across the street from us, someone's remodeling their home. She says, Dad, I want to be a builder. Can you introduce me to builders? And I said, oh, don't worry. You're going to meet a lot of builders from here on out. Don't even worry about it. But there's something intrinsic in kids. We want to build stuff. We want to make our homes better. We want to make our homes more reliable, more secure. That's what we're all about. And that's what we're going to do together. So thank you, and with that, I want to open it up to any questions. Thank you. And if there are no questions, we can move to dessert. <laughs> Caesar. The affordable housing issue can be difficult because the need density for affordable housing and is no space people, probably the same people Absolutely right. Um, I'm from Scarsdale. I'm on the Scarsdale Planning Board. I know exactly what you're talking about. Open space is an asset, but at the same time, you need places to build, and you need places where people are going to live and want to live. And it is a perennial fight between, I don't like to necessarily call them NIMBYites, but they are defenders of the neighborhood, which is a more dramatic title, um, and is actually the title of a very good sociological study on this. Um, it, that, it, that work is the hard boring of hard boards. You just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing because ultimately everybody agrees on affordable housing. They don't necessarily agree on affordable housing down the street. Um, they also don't necessarily agree on affordable housing if they feel that open spaces will be limited or their quality of life will be impacted. All of that may be true, but at this point the need is so great we just have to convince people that this is what we have to do because how else are we going? Other questions or comments? And if you want to leave an anonymous comment, you see we, we're now including as a regular feature of all of our programs survey forms, the, the canary yellow um, forms at your table. So if you want to talk smack about me in, in private, that's fine. I imagine, Jimmy, I'll leave you with this. It is bad. There's absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The other thing that I'll say, by the way, there aren't many of them, but there are also yimbies, which is yes in my backyard. There are people who understand the value, and we're seeing that in some communities, actually, where they do support these types of larger projects that most neighborhoods rebel against, because they do want the economic value. Right? Other thoughts? Other questions? Other jokes? Mine were not that good. I need some new material. James. <laughs> We're all aware of the, uh, the uh, settlement that happened between the county and, and the federal government regarding the, uh, the, 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 the regarding dispersing affordable housing in the county, and uh, with, with with the new Democratic majority in the county legislature, how do you see that working out? Um, so it's a consent decree, so they have to abide by its terms or run afoul of the federal government. 
I think we saw efforts in the previous decade to stretch that court settlement out to the fullest extent possible. I would anticipate, even with the county legislature, um, switching to a Democratic supermajority, which, by the way, surprised the heck out of many people, including some of them. Um, I would imagine that they're more likely to abide by it. But it's a conversation that we need to have. If for no other reason than we know that the county executive has put forward this affordable housing needs assessment. It does get very specific about the types of communities that need this more than others. They're not all in Yonkers and Mount Vernon and New Rochelle. In fact, you need to build affordable housing where people live, where your workforce is. And that was one of the key findings. The question for the county legislature is about how you find space for the incentives that will make that possible within the budget. It is not something that they looked at extensively when they passed their most recent budget. It may not be something that they've looked at for some period of time. I would not anticipate that the county legislature is likely to push against that general principle that you should be building, um, building and spreading out where the affordable housing is within the county. There's not a lot of area where they hold a lot of sway in that area because most of that is precluded by local zoning ordinances where they don't particularly have a say. So they might just say, hey, not my job, it's off my desk. But where they do need to step up is they need to pay a lot more attention uh, to the county's resources and really put their money where their mouth is. They say that they want more affordable housing, and they want more diverse affordable housing, they want more workforce housing, that's wonderful. We agree. How do we structure that to make it economically viable? That's the role that I anticipate having conversations with them about planning. All right. Hearing no further comments and seeing no further hands, I'm going to say thank you so much for being here. If you like what you see, please pass it on. Please bring more people. You know, we're only as strong as everybody in this room and everybody in the email.